Well, welcome, everybody. I appreciate you joining us today, whether you're doing that in person at one of our campuses or online. Either way, I just want you to know I'm really glad that you're here. And maybe for those of you who are new or if you've been out for a while, let me just kind of catch you up on where we've been as a church over these last couple of weeks. We've been exploring the connection between love and sacrifice. Because most of the time, we tend to think of love as an emotion that we feel towards somebody. But what we've been discovering is that love is so much more than an emotion we feel. Love is less about how we feel towards someone and really more about what we are willing to do for someone. That, that the essence of love, love at its heart, is a willingness to sacrificially put the needs of another ahead of our own. Let me say that again. Love, at its heart, is a willingness to sacrificially put the needs of another ahead of your own. And the reason that I know that that is what love is is because that's how Jesus defined love. Love. In fact, notice these words of Jesus from our theme verse in this series, John 15, or John chapter 15, verse 13. Look at what Jesus says. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And for Jesus, this was not just some declaration of how he felt about us, but it was a commitment of what he was willing to do for us. In fact, just a few hours after making that statement, Jesus would literally sacrifice his life because of his love for us. And so because of that, for those of us who are Christ followers, and I'm not assuming everyone listening to me is a Christ follower, but for those of us who are, that means our lives are to be marked by love. That's what makes us different from the world around us, that we are marked by love. And so because of that, sacrificial service to the needs of others has to be an essential part of who we are and the way that we live our lives. Now, I think most of us would agree with that in theory, The problem is it's just real difficult to live that out in our overcrowded, busy, daily lives. We want to serve. We want to help. But it's just easier to make excuses. Or sometimes it's just easier to feel like we're not qualified or we'll get in there and we'll mess it up if we try to help others. But you know one of the biggest barriers to sacrificially serving others is? One of the biggest barriers to meeting the needs of others is when your life has been turned upside down by uncertainty. When you're going through your own difficulties, when you're dealing with your own struggles, it's hard to think about meeting other people's needs when you have unmet needs yourself. In fact, over these last couple of years, With everything that's happened with the pandemic in our nation, I think that is proof positive that in times of uncertainty, our natural tendency is to turn inward, not outward, right? Over these last couple of years, there were not a lot of us running around looking at how we could help others. We were looking at how can I survive? How can I take care of me and my family. The reason we do that is not because we're, you know, mean, selfish, self-centered people. It's just because in times of uncertainty, we're desperate for security. We're desperate for comfort. And so we turn towards self-preservation in the difficult days. But here's the thing. The truth is self-help is really no help at all. Actually, self-sacrifice is the path to that peace, to that comfort, that security that we all desire. Not my words, Jesus' words. Notice Matthew 16, 25. Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, if you give away your life for my sake, then and only then will you actually 
save it. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that self-care is a bad thing. I'm not saying, I don't care what you're going through, you know, suck it up, buttercup, get out there and help other people. No, there are times when self-care is essential. We see that in Jesus' life, right? Jesus healing huge crowds, preaching, teaching, doing all that. But often he would withdraw, even when people had needs to be met, in order to renew and refresh his life and his relationship with God. I, I'm not saying that self-care is bad. What I am saying is that struggles and difficulties don't disqualify you from being used by God to serve and help others. In fact, it's in your struggles and in your difficulties that you may often find your best opportunities to serve others. You've heard me say many times, your greatest ministry may come out of your deepest pain. And so to help us do that, here's what I want to do today. I want to look at a great example of someone in the midst of their own uncertainty was willing to sacrifice and serve another. This story is found in a little known book in the Old Testament that is called the book of Ruth. But it really ought to be called the book of Naomi and Ruth because it is an amazing story of two women who were experiencing tremendous uncertainty, who had deep unmet needs in their own life. And yet we'll watch them serve one another and watch God show up and bring blessing in the midst of their brokenness. Now, if you've never read the Bible before, or if you've read the Bible your whole life and you're a student of it, either way, I'm telling you, the book of Ruth is a great read. It's a phenomenal book. It's a beautiful love story. It's got drama. It's got plot twists. It's way better than the notebook, ladies. It is a phenomenal love story. And, and it's only four chapters long. You can read this whole book in about 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm going to skim over the surface. I'm going to run through it like a jackrabbit. But I want you to take some time this week, find a Bible or a Bible app, and dig into this phenomenal story of finding blessing in the brokenness of our lives. Because these two ladies, in doing that and sacrificially serving, will find not only do they end up getting their needs met, but they actually end up being a part of a much bigger God story. So five things we learn from Ruth and Naomi about finding blessing in the brokenness. Let's jump in. Number one, the first thing I have to do is to commit to focusing on others. I have to commit to focusing on others, no matter what's going on in my life. The book of Ruth opens in the very first page or very first verse with a crisis. There's a problem. There is a famine in the land of Judah. And so a woman by the name of Naomi, along with her husband and her two sons, they have to leave their hometown of Bethlehem and travel hundreds of miles to, in order to escape the famine and survive and not starve to death. And they end up in a foreign land known as Moab which is bad enough to be living in a foreign land, but not long after they got there, Naomi's husband dies suddenly. So now Naomi is a widow living in a strange land. And by the way, in those cultures, in those times, widows were completely vulnerable there was not a social safety support net. There was no, you know, food stamps. There was no social security. There was no insurance, and they couldn't work. And so that they were completely upended when they lost their husband. And so that's bad enough. But then Naomi's two sons end up marrying Moabite women. Not ideal for a Jewish mother to have her sons marry outside of the culture and the faith. And then when you think can't get worse, both of her sons die suddenly. So now she's in a foreign land, no husband, 
Both her sons are dead, and all she's got are these two young Moabite widows who are now vulnerable, destitute, and struggling. There's a ton of uncertainty there. But Naomi begins to hear rumor that the famine is starting to end in Judah. And so she decides to go back to Bethlehem, to go back home, and both of these widowed daughter-in-law say, well, we probably should go with you. We should all stick together because we're all in bad shape. And Naomi, focusing on their needs over her own, says to them, no, you need to stay here in your homeland. You're both still very young. Both of you have a much better chance of getting married in your own land than getting married in my country because we don't really like that whole intercultural, interracial marriage. So it's better for you to stay here. One of the daughter-in-laws, Orpah, she decides that's a good idea and she stays. But the other daughter-in-law, Ruth, has a much different response. Notice Ruth 1.16. But Ruth replied, she's talking to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. What a beautiful picture of love, a commitment. Some of you are familiar with that verse. You've heard it before, probably at a wedding ceremony. Because this verse is often quoted within wedding ceremonies because it's a beautiful picture of love and commitment. But think about it from Ruth's standpoint, right? She's committing to an unknown, more difficult, more uncertain life, but she recognizes that Naomi probably needs her because she's got no one else. Can I just tell you one of the hardest things to do when you're struggling One of the hardest things to do in your own pain is to notice the pain and the needs of others. And yet, it is the key to finding God's blessings. And the reason I know that is not just because I've read the book of Ruth. It's because I've experienced in the reality of my life's journey. And please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying in your pain. I'm not minimizing it. I'm not saying, look, suck it up, buttercup. Quit feeling sorry for yourself and get out there and help others. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that the more I focus on my pain and my struggle, the more I allow that pain and struggle to control me, and the more I start to see myself as a victim of the uncertainty in my life. But if I can lift up my eyes, and notice the pain of others, and allow God to help me help other hurting people, I can begin to start to find God's blessings. Number two, not only do we need to commit to focusing on others, but we also have to trust God's timing. We have to trust God's timing. Serving others in the midst of your own uncertainty is not some magic spiritual formula that's going to bring immediate relief to your pain and struggle. It is only the first step. All your pain's not going to go away. Everything's not going to be roses and hunky-dory, but at least you're taking that first step. I mean, think about it. When Ruth makes this commitment to Naomi, nothing changes in her circumstances, right? She's still just a widow who's hitched her wagon to another widow who have no way to live, no way to support themselves, and no real hope of a brighter future. But here's where it's so cool. As they make their way back to Bethlehem, when they arrive, something really interesting is happening in Bethlehem. Notice Ruth 1.22. It says, so Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Talk about great timing. The fact that it's the harvest means two things. One, it means the famine really is over. 
There's food to eat. They're not going to starve to death. And in the nation of Israel, which does not exist in the nation of Moab, but in the nation of Israel, there is a custom that during the harvest season, widows can come into anybody's field and pick up any left behind grain. It was called gleaning. And so wherever the harvest was, they just walked behind the workers. And since uh, wheat or barley, it was harvested by hand. It wasn't the most efficient method. So a lot of stuff would be left in the field. And so widows could come and pick up and have enough food to eat. And we're going to see not, not only was God meeting that short-term need so that Naomi and Ruth wouldn't starve to death, But as you're going to see as we continue through this story, God is using that blessing to work out a longer-term solution for both of these women. Doesn't happen overnight, but you got to trust God's timing. Pastor and theologian John Piper describes the walk of the believer as less like an interstate highway in Nebraska and more like driving on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Anybody ever driven an interstate in Nebraska? Let me see your hands. Right. It's flat. It's straight. It's smooth. It's a straight shot, right? And sometimes we think, well, if I follow Jesus, shouldn't my life just be a smooth, straight shot right to glory? No. It's more like driving on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Anybody driven on the Blue Ridge Parkway? It's a beautiful drive, but let me tell you, it is a dangerous, curvy, slow, difficult drive trip, isn't it? There are hairpin turns. There are cliffs with just a tiny little guardrail. There's rock slides. There's bears. There's all kinds of things that can be. In fact, sometimes on the Blue Ridge Parkway, it's so curvy that you have to go the wrong way for a while to be able to go the right way. You ever seen that where you're heading north, but the curve's so sharp, you literally have to go south for a couple of miles before you can turn back? That is what the life of following Jesus is like. It's not a smooth path to glory. It's a daily struggle full of great beauty and also full of great difficulties. But here's the thing. God makes sure that we get there eventually. And that's the heart. Not in our time. But his timing is always perfect. Finding blessings in the brokenness, we've got to commit to focusing on others. We've got to trust God's time. And then third thing, we've got to do what we can. I've got to do what I can. See, the more you want to experience God's blessings, the more you've got to be willing to, faith, to be faithful to do what you can do. Experiencing God's blessings is not just letting go and letting God. It's not just kicking back in your recliner with your Cheetos and go, okay, God, work it out, and I'll be right here when you're done. No, we have to be intentional and active in doing what we can when we can. Now, I want to be really clear here so you're not confused. I am not saying that we should sacrificially serve others so that we can earn God's blessing. It is not a transactional. God's not a vending machine where you put in the right service and the right, you know, religious activity and then all of a sudden you're going to get the goodies. No. It's just being willing to be faithful with the opportunities that God provides us to serve others when he provides them. So that's what Ruth does. She does, goes out and does the only thing that she can do. And that's try to glean enough grain so that her and Naomi don't starve to death. Little does she know that the field that she just randomly chose to glean in turns out to be a field that belongs to a man by the name of Boaz. And Boaz is not only a wealthy man, but he's a generous and kind man and He's related to Naomi. He's a part of the family. In fact, Ruth is out there gleaning. Boaz shows up to check on the harvest, and he asks one of his workers, hey, wait a minute, that lady, I've never seen that young lady before. Who is she? 
And notice their answer, Ruth 2, 6 and 7. The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Do you see that? Because Ruth was willing to be faithful to do the only thing that she could do. Not only does God meet their need for food to survive, but he makes sure she can glean it in a safe place. Right? Because for widows who gleaned, especially young, attractive widows, they were often vulnerable to the farm hands. They were often taken advantage of. If you want to glean here, you got to do this or you got to do that. They were incredibly vulnerable. And if you read the rest of the book of Ruth, I hope you do, you'll discover that Boaz, because he's family, he's heard about Ruth's commitment to Naomi. And so he tells his men, make sure you intentionally leave extra barley. Leave whole stalks. Make sure she has more than enough. And he says, make sure nobody lays a hand on her. She is special. Take care of her. How cool is that? God makes sure they not only have enough blessing to just for the two ladies to eat and survive, but he makes sure they have more than enough grain so that they can eat what they need and sell the others so that they have income in order to buy other things. That's, God is just so cool like that. But just when you think that's the extent of God's blessings for Ruth's faithfulness, plot twist, Boaz is single, ladies. He is single. And so as Ruth just keeps showing up, gleaning, being faithful in what she can do, she and Boaz begin to talk and communicate and they begin to develop a little relationship. Now remember, why did Naomi tell Ruth and the other daughter-in-law stay in Moab? Because the chances of you finding a husband in Judah slim to none. And because there's been a famine for years, even if you find a man who will marry you, he's probably broke because the economy has tanked. And yet, with God, he is always able to do immeasurably more than we can ever ask or imagine. But it doesn't happen just because we pray or just because we show up to a service and sing hallelujah. It comes from being faithful to do what you can when you can. And not only that, there's a fourth thing we have to do to find blessing in the brokenness. We got to be willing to take a risk. We got to be willing to take a risk. I've said throughout this series that anytime you get out of the boat, to follow Jesus, to sacrificially serve others, you're always going to end up in over your head, right? Whether it's doing something you've done all your life or serving in some way you've never served before, either way, the needs of people around you are always bigger than you. You're always going to be in over your head. It's always going to be risky. But isn't that what faith is? A willingness to risk, not risk for the sake of risk, but being willing to risk trusting God more than I trust myself and more than I trust my circumstances. That's what Ruth does, because what she does next is really risky. See, there was another custom in ancient Israel. It was the custom of something known as the kinsman redeemer. Because widows were so vulnerable, if a man died and left a widow behind and she had no male son, she had no sons to help take care of her or carry on the family name, then the nearest male relative who was available had the responsibility and or the opportunity to marry that widow in order to not only make sure she was taken care of, but also to try to carry on the family name name. And so that, that custom was not a requirement. A kinsman redeemer was not required to redeem the widow of a family member. 
It was optional. And so because of that, there was a way for the widow to express her desire to be redeemed. There was this weird little custom. If she wanted to be redeemed by a kinsman, what she would do is when he was sleeping or laying down, she was to go and simply lay down at his feet and ask him to cover her with his garment. It was a symbol of saying, I'm going to be your protector provider. It was a way of saying yes to kind of a reverse proposal. And that's exactly what Ruth does. Boaz, along with his workers, are at the threshing floor near the field. The threshing floor is a place where when the barley's harvested, you beat it on hard ground and let the wind separate the wheat from the chaff. And it was a long, difficult day, and during harvest season, it was work from sunup to sundown. So the workers, and in this case Boaz, they slept on the threshing floor. And so Ruth goes and she finds where Boaz is sleeping And she lays down at his feet. And at some point during the night, something wakes him up and notice the conversation. Ruth 3, 9. Who are you, Boaz asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. It's a risky move, right? He could have rejected her. He said, no, you know, I'm not going to marry a Moabite. You don't really bring anything to the table. I'm I'm not going to. Or she could have been seen by some of the workers and thought, well, you know, she's just a gold digger. She's just trying to get Boaz to sleep with her and marry her. It's a risk. But because she takes that risk, notice the response. Ruth 3.11. Boaz says, and now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. How do they know? Because she stuck with Naomi, because she showed up in the fields doing what she could. But this is really important. Notice this. For Ruth, this is not some wild shot in the dark risk. This is actually her just following and taking the next step of where she'd been seeing God moving and working in her life, bringing her to Bethlehem, putting her in the right field, connecting her relationally with Boaz. This was just the next logical but risky step to finding God's blessing in the brokenness. And just when you think, wow, what a story. That really is better than the notebook. She finds this great, kind, wealthy man and happily ever after. What a great story. But just when you think God's done blessing, he takes it to a whole nother level. And that's why the fifth thing we have to do is watch God work. See, because not only does Ruth get a husband who can be a protector, provider for her and her mother-in-law, Naomi, But God also blesses her with one of the greatest blessings in that culture, the birth of a child. Remember, Ruth had been married to Naomi's son in Moab for 10 years and never had a child. In that culture, going childless was never by choice. And so the writer of the book of Ruth wants us to understand that she is bare. She is unable to have children. But look at what happens shortly after she marries Boaz. Ruth 4.13 says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And then check it out. The Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. Isn't that remarkable? A barren widow, a long way from home, who had known nothing but setback after setback, and yet chose to serve others sacrificially, to trust God when it didn't make sense to trust God. And God blesses her with a son. But God's not done. This, is, this child, this son, is not just an answer to Ruth and Naomi's prayers, but it turns out this child is part of God's redemptive plan to bring hope to the entire world. Look at Ruth 4, verse 16. 
Look at what it says about this child. They named him, they named this child Obed. He was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. Yeah, that David, that great king, the greatest king the nation of Israel had ever known. This child is the grandfather of that David, who is also the line through which the Messiah, the ultimate blessing and hope of the world will come. That's the message I want you to take with you today. Your struggle, your difficulty, your pain, it is not meaningless. It's not some isolated issue that you have to deal with alone. It's all part of a much bigger story of hope that God is writing across the pages of your life and across the pages of history. And look, I know that doesn't make the pain go away. And it doesn't fix everything. And it doesn't make you glad that you are going through it or have been through it. But it is enough hope for you to be able to take the next step. To just keep stepping. To just keep trusting God. Even when your heart and life are shattered. That is the message of hope. That's where we find the blessing of God in the difficult, dangerous, and twisty road of life he calls us to, but he gets us to glory eventually, and he is faithful. Would you pray with me? I don't really know what you walked in here with today. I don't know your struggle. I don't know your pain. I don't know the uncertainty that surrounds you in your life right now. I'm sorry that you're going through that. And I wish you weren't. But I also want you to know you're not here today by accident. God, because he loves you so much, brought you here so that you could hear this story that reflects his love, not just for widows in the ancient land, but the way that he loves you and the way that he is calling you to follow him by lifting your eyes, seeing the pain and struggle of others, being faithful to just do what you can when you can to wait patiently on his timing. Because one day, and I don't know when, one day you'll sit back and you will be amazed at what God has been doing and what he's going to do in your life. He's faithful. He loves you. And you're not alone. Father, help us to recognize that today. Help us to walk in our pain following you into the life and the homes and the hearts of the broken around us because we're all broken in different ways. Help us to begin that path of healing in our life and the life of others. Jesus, we cannot do it on our own. We need a supernatural touch from you today. So pour out your spirit. Move among your people long after we've left these places so that we will see your faithfulness and give you glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen.